Thanks, Roger. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll get. Um, We're going to use it without the mic. They can hear right now, but it's not going to be superior sound. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm being told that they've disconnected the microphone, which is going to allow you to hear, but sound. not as well. Is that correct? We have sound. We got, we got sound. Yeah, there's. Okay, so there's we good. got sound. So, welcome back. We have sound. We had some technical difficulties here. They're working on it. But welcome to the Bowersville Church of Christ Loyal Men and Women Sunday School class. It's good for us to be here, and we're thankful for you as well. We're going to have prayer requests at the end of the uh, lesson today. Betty is here today to keep me on time, so we're going to have a prayer request uh, at the end of the lesson, and we'll have a time of prayer. So if you have prayer requests that you want to share with us, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, get them to us. Uh, Roger and Jerry are up in the control booth monitoring, and they'll get those for us on the screen so that we can have a time of prayer later. Brief COVID update. Um, as you know, and I'm, I'm trying to to be sensitive here and not just repeat everything you already know by the same token i want to be able to give you you know some local uh information um the virus is spreading it's spreading um rapidly at this point in time the um, positivity rate is the highest it's been the numbers of cases are the highest they've been um the last few days we've been over 10,000 cases a day in the state of ohio and our particular part of the state is the most active part of the state right now for COVID-19. So we are really in the epicenter, if you will, of the infection. And it is spreading. You don't need me to tell you that. Um, many of you have come in contact with it. Many of you have had it. Many of you, if not all of you, know someone close to you who's had the virus or is suffering from it right now. So it um, is very active. That positivity rate tells us how fast the virus is spreading among us. And it is spreading at a faster rate than it's ever spread. And unfortunately, the likelihood is, is that that will continue and even get worse in the weeks ahead. You've heard me say before that the so-called experts had predicted that this virus would be the worst between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And so far, it looks like they're right. It looks like their predictions are correct. So that's the bad news. The good news is they are predicting that after the first of the year, after we've had a couple of rounds of vaccinations, that those numbers will start to decline. And hopefully the numbers will decline as rapidly as they are uh, expanding right now, as rapidly as it's spreading. Hopefully those numbers will decline. You've all heard about the vaccine. The vaccine is a reality now. It is coming. Um, the state of Ohio, which was initially only supposed to get 30,000 doses, which is not very many compared to the, the population as a whole, but now it's scheduled to get 98,000 doses. So over three times the initial number expected is coming. Now those doses will be gobbled up pretty quickly. You have to understand that you have to divide those doses by two because it's a two-step shot, okay? You have to take one injection, then you take another injection 21 to 28 days later. And so that is 98,000 doses, and let's just do Jamestown math, 100,000 doses is gonna vaccinate about 50,000 people, okay? So we're looking at about 50,000 people. There is a tiered process, and right now, the vaccine to be eligible for it, you have to either be a frontline worker or someone that is in a closed environment living arrangement. Uh, skilled nursing, uh, assisted living, those types of things. I think primarily more skilled nursing than anything. Inpatient rehab programs, those programs where you're breathing uh, airspace with many others, and that's where it spreads the quickest. Those are the people that are most valuable. So most likely, if you're listening to me now, unless you're a frontline health worker or an EMS responder, chances are you're not gonna be eligible for the first round or two of vaccine. So then the vaccines are gonna be coming on a weekly basis, and as time goes, more and more people are gonna be vaccinated. Now, there are many people among us that are not going to be vaccinated. The vaccine is not mandatory. You don't have to take it. It's gonna be highly recommended, especially for the people at the highest 
uh, risk to take the vaccine, but it's, it's gonna be optional. The vaccine at this point in time is extremely effective, extremely effective. A hundred percent of the people who take the vaccine so far, none have had any serious consequences from a COVID-19 illness. In other words, it's prevented the illness 95% of the time. It's prevented complications from the illness 100% of the time. Zero hospitalizations in the people who have taken the virus. Right now, hospitalizations are critical to us. Our hospitals are bulging at the seams, and our local hospitals are bulging at the seams. And we're okay, and right now, it's not, um, it's not a disaster, but right now, I can tell you that we're feeling the pressure, we're feeling the, the difficulty of our hospitals bulging at the seams, and our caregivers are coming down with the virus at higher rates than ever. So we have this equation, if you will, where we have demand for the hospital going up and our ability to provide care going down. And that's a challenge. That's a real challenge, okay? So um, anything we can do to prevent hospitalizations right now is key. A development just this week, monoclonal antibodies, okay? And uh, I, I'm, uh, I have a tr trouble pronouncing this word. It's bamblanavir. It's a, it's a long word, starts with a B, okay, about nine letters. But it is a monoclonal antibody that has been approved for emergency use and it's now available. This past week, it became available. And this past week, I've had about five patients that we've given this treatment to. It's very specific. It's for those people that are at the highest risk of hospitalization. If you come down with the virus and you're over 65, if you have lung disease, if you're on oxygen, if you have kidney disease, if you are on any immunosuppressive drugs or you have an illness that suppresses your immune system, you may be a candidate for this treatment. If you are a candidate for this treatment, your physician has to order the treatment, then you are scheduled to go to an infusion center to receive the treatment. It's an IV treatment. It takes about an hour and then they monitor you for an hour after the treatment. This is the same treatment or the same class of treatment that President Trump received. You remember when he went in and he got the treatment and then hours later he said, I'm a new man, I can feel, I feel better. It helped me almost immediately. That was the monoclonal antibody treatment and that's available now. It's available today. I've sent people, I've sent people yesterday, I've sent people today. Um, my patients are getting it. If they meet that criteria, I'm recommending it because it literally can stop the virus or slow the virus for sure in its tracks, okay? That monoclonal antibody will bind to the virus and it, in general, is expected to pre prevent serious illness and definitely prevent hospitalization. So that's the value to this, is if we can prevent people from getting really sick and prevent people from going to the hospital, that's key. And so that's what we're doing now with this monoclonal antibody while we're waiting on a vaccine. The vaccine, as I said, it should be here the one or about the 15th of December, and we should start seeing vaccinations take place. We're now in a point here where we're seeing infections going up, we're gonna see vaccinations going up, and that's gonna ultimately end up being a positive dynamic, okay? because as more and more people become immune naturally, and as more and more people are vaccinated and become immune, our immunity numbers are gonna go up. And we're gonna to try to approach herd, herd immunity, okay? Now, depending on who you talk to, that herd immunity number is uh, two thirds of, of a population group. So when that number gets up to two thirds of people that have either had the virus or people have been vaccinated from the virus, we should have herd immunity. When we have herd immunity, then all of this gets much better, much more quickly. We'll see numbers drop dramatically, and this will hopefully get smaller and smaller in our rear view mirror, okay? Still, having said that, we're looking at months for this to happen, months for this to happen. So, I don't want to weary you with bad news, but we're in a critical phase right now, okay? You all, most everyone I know has done a great job at this, okay? Because trust me, it could be much, much, much worse than it is. Even though we're in the epicenter of it now, it could be much worse. It's not time to panic, but it's time 
times to pay attention. Don't let your guard down now. Of all times, now's not the time to let your guard down. Okay? Because it is out there hot around you. I'll, I promise you, if you go out in public right now in southwest Ohio, you are being exposed to the virus. No question about it. Okay? No question about it. So you need to assume that that's the case. You need to take every precaution that you can take to prevent you contracting it, okay? Social distancing, masks, hand sanitation, all the things you already know. Now's the time to double down on those efforts. If you don't need to be exposed, don't be exposed. There's light at the end of the tunnel. It's coming. Things are going to get better, all right? But you don't want to fumble the ball in one yard line, all right? You don't want to do that. So, um, kind of a mixed message. It's real to me at the coroner's office this morning, I, I received a call this morning that someone in our area, 37 years old, died this morning from the COVID-19 at home. Okay. So it's out there, it's real, and uh, it's among us. So pay attention, do your due diligence, be responsible for yourself and for everyone else around you, okay? And uh, if you come down with the virus, that's not a sign of weakness, it's not a sign that you were irresponsible or negligent necessarily at all okay the reality is it's out there as time goes as much as i'm exposed i will come down with the virus sooner or later it's going to get me okay if uh, you know i don't get vaccinated or you know herd immunity doesn't develop sooner or later we're all going to get it without some intervention and the intervention is the vaccine that is in essence, are really our only tool to prevent it from occurring is the vaccine. That's all we got. And so, uh, fortunately, it's effective. Fortunately, it appears to be safe right now, extremely safe. And so, uh, as time goes, these reports will get better. So, having said that, we are going to now really get into what we we're here for, and that's study God's Word. If you have a Bible, look at Philippians, we're in chapter 1, and we're going to be in verses 12 through 18 today. We may get beyond that, but I doubt it. Um, hopefully we'll get that far today, maybe not if we don't get so far. But this passage could be entitled or summarized as the joy of ministry, part 1. Philippians is the epistle of joy. The apostle Paul, who was imprisoned in Rome, wrote the book of Philippians, or the letter or the epistle to the Philippians. And this epistle is all about joy. And so as we study this epistle, it's my prayer that our joy be made full and that we be made complete in joy. If the apostle Paul can be joyful in what he was going through, I promise you, we can be joyful in what we're going through. Even this pandemic and all of the things that are happening in our world today, we should be people of joy. The joy should be full. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So let's study here in Philippians chapter 1, okay? And I'm going to read verses 12 through 18 quickly, and then we're going to come back, okay? This is the Apostle Paul here saying, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Indeed, some indeed, Preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter, out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. The Apostle Paul realized and recognized that in spite of trouble and detractors, God 
plan, the gospel, the good news would be fulfilled. You know, the truest measure of a Christian spiritual maturity is what it takes to rob him and her of their spirit bestowed joy. I think it was last week that I mentioned that as a younger man, it was easy to derail my train. I mean, as I look back, I can think of times when my train was derailed by situations or circumstances or something that someone did or something that someone done or had done or something that happened during my day would just derail my train. And I tell everybody that it takes just seconds for the train to derail, but it can take hours to clean up the mess. Okay? But a sure sign of spiritual maturity is a train that stays, the joy train that stays on the tracks and keeps going no matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstances. As we study the book of Philippians, Paul matured, Paul's maturity is evident. In the present text, he makes it clear that as difficult and unpleasant, painful, even life-threatening circumstances did not rob Paul of his joy, but rather caused it to increase. Think about it for a minute. Think about if you or I are spiritually mature enough that no matter what man or Satan throws at us, no matter what happens in our daily lives, that our joy doesn't diminish, but it gets stronger. What a way to live. What a life to experience that no matter what happens, the joy of the Lord abounds. Okay? Joy is given to every believer. We looked at Galatians 5.22, and we've looked at it uh, so many times. And uh, I'm going to commit myself to memorizing the order of it, which I haven't done yet. But Galatians 5.22 and 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The only certain cause for the loss of joy that we have, the only thing that really can steal our joy when you think about it, when you analyze it, actually is, is what? Sin. Sin. Okay? Nothing other than sin, other than sin should steal our joy. Okay? If you look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. We see, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. You see, it's the Lord's desire, it's God's desire that our joy be full. It's his desire that we be people of joy and that no matter what we face, no matter what hardship, no matter what trouble comes our way, that our joy be full. You see, our joy is not based on externals. It's not based on situations or circumstances. It's not based on how much money is in your bank account, or it's not based on what kind of car you drive, or it's not based on what kind of shoes you wear. True joy, his joy, comes from within. Okay? And he's given it to us completely and fully. It's there. It's there. If we choose to walk in the Spirit, we will exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. And we will be full of His joy. Okay? So joy is every, given to every believer. It's constant and it's full. It's not based on our situations or our circumstances. Like I said, the only certain cause for the loss of joy is, uh, uh, is sin in our life. Sin separates us from Him. And that's the only thing that should ever take our joy. And the only way to restore joy is to repent and return to proper worship and obedience. Nothing other than sin should ever steal our joy. If we respond to adversity in a sinful way, we'll lose our joy. Okay? We'll lose our joy. When something comes along and we respond to it out of anger, we respond to it out of bitterness, we respond to it 
in a sinful way, I promise you it will not be a joyful experience. The thing we have to understand is this. Trouble is certain. I promise you, today, something is going to try to steal your joy. Today. Today, probably before the end of this Sunday school lesson, Satan will try to steal your joy if he can. Okay? There's no question about it. Look at John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. We're going to have tribulation. The trouble is certain. No one is exempt. Look at John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Jesus was not above persecution. In fact, Jesus came to walk our walk and experience tribulation and trials, persecution above and beyond what any of us will ever experience. And we certainly aren't above him. Look at James 1, 2 through 4. Patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Count it all joy when you face trials. I said a minute ago, it used to be easier to derail my train. Now, you can still derail my train. I can still get a serious case of boo boo, okay? But it doesn't happen as often as it used to. And it takes a lot more to do that than it used to. Why is that? Because I've been there and done that in many cases. It's not my first rodeo. And you learn as you go. And so that's what James is telling us here. Count it all joy when you face the various trials because it produces patience in your life. And you become mature and complete, lacking nothing. Okay? No one is exempt. Paul's joy is never, Paul's joy never falters. According to what we read in God's Word. Look at Philippians 4.4. 4. Paul talks about it a little bit. Philippians 4.4 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Look at Philippians, or look at verse 4, verses 10 through 13. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now at last, your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to me, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, Paul was mature. It took a lot to derail Paul's train. A lot. And in fact, Paul says in this passage that nothing is going to derail his train. Because he has learned, he has experienced fullness and, and emptiness, he's experienced hunger, he's experienced you name it. The Apostle Paul had been there and done that. And nothing was going to steal his joy. So Paul had planned a ministry in Rome, okay? We know that. We know in Romans chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, Paul had said, Oh, 
Paul had said this in Romans chapter 1, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit and the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests that by some means now, at last, I might find a way in the will of God to come to you. Paul had planned a ministry in Rome. He had planned it. And I don't know specifically what his plans were. I don't know what they involved. But I am certain his plans did not involve being imprisoned and chained 18 inches to a Roman soldier for two years. I can guarantee you that was not his plan. Okay, that's not his plan. And guess what? That was God's plan. That was Paul's ministry in Rome, his Roman imprisonment. You think? Wow. I would have planned something at the Colosseum, like a Billy Graham crusade. We would have gotten out there on Facebook. We would have turned Iola loose with all of our friends. And we would have had thousands of people there. I would have maybe got the local radio station to advertise it a little bit. Okay? And we would have had a big time if, if I would have planned the Roman ministry. I mean, Billy Graham would have nothing on us. Okay? We, it'd be big. Right? That's what I would have done. All right? But if we would have done that, guess what? We wouldn't have the book of Philippians that we would be reading now over 2,000 years later. How many tens of millions of people have been impacted by this book? Not only this, but all of the others that were written during that time. Okay? You see, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His plans are higher than our plans. Okay? Paul arrived in Rome after a disastrous shipwreck. And Paul sang night and day. He was ended up being chained night and day to a Roman soldier, as I said, for two years. That doesn't sound real exciting to me. That doesn't sound very impactful to me. Okay? But again, God knew exactly what he was doing. So, in verses 12 through 26 of this passage, I just read 12 through 18, and we're going to get to the rest of them in the next few weeks. But in verses 12 through 26, Paul reveals four elements of his joy. Okay? Four elements of his joy. In verses 12 through 14, which we're going to study here in a second, he talks about joy in spite of trouble. How his joy persisted despite trouble. In verses 15 through 18, he talks about being joyful in spite of detractors. In verses 19 through 21, he talks about being joyful in spite of death. And in verses 20 through 2 through 26, he talks about being joyful in spite of being in the flesh. So let's look at this. We're, we're going to break this down. Paul's talking about the joy of his ministry. He had planned to come to Rome. He was excited to be in Rome. Okay. No doubt he was looking forward to it. We read in Romans, the first chapter there, that he was praying that God would show him how to be effective in his ministry in Rome. And as I said, I'm sure he wasn't planning on a shipwreck to get there, being arrested, and being chained to a Roman soldier. I don't think that was his plan. Yet he did not let that derail his train. Now, I have said a minute ago, it takes more to derail my train, but... You throw me in the cold ocean for a few days and then chain me to a Roman soldier, my train would be derailed, I, I'll tell you, at least for a while. Okay? Maybe ever, forever. Okay? That would derail my train. But not the Apostle Paul. So let's look here in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Okay? We're going to talk now for the rest of this morning probably about being joyful in spite of trouble, trial, or tribulation. In chapter, or in verse 12 of chapter 1, Paul says this, But I want you to know, I want you to know, and I, I want to pause here for a minute, because for me anyway, I 
read over this stuff and so many times something is really important it just I don't I don't understand it or grasp it enough to realize the importance. When Paul says here, I want you to know, he's saying, I want you to get this. I don't want you to miss this. Okay? This is important. I want you to understand. Okay? He says, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So he summarizes it right up front here by saying, these things that have happened to me have actually furthered the gospel more than I could have planned, or more than what I would have expected. Okay? They furthered the gospel. So, he goes on to talk about in verse 13. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Okay? It's become evident to the whole palace guard and all the rest. Okay? That my chains are in Christ. Now we're going to talk about this for a little bit. Okay? You see, what we would expect as being a negative for Paul being arrested and being put into this situation that he was in. God actually had greater plans and it had an opposite effect. And that happened so much. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I have become a fool boasting for Boasting, in boasting. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Truly, the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is what for what is it in which you were inferior to other churches, except that I myself was not burdensome to you, forgetting this long book? The take home there is, is that when I am weak, when I'm the weakest, I'm the strongest. Because when I'm the weakest, that is when I completely allow him to work through me. Okay? Paul's ultimate goal was for the progress of the gospel. Okay? Paul knew that hardship was inevitable. He knew, he understood, he recognized that Satan would do everything in his power to stop Paul. That he's waiting on him. Okay? Which means the warrant that he knows. So we're going to pick up there next week. And we're going to talk about Paul's hardship. We're going to talk about the impact of this imprisonment made. Okay? Paul wasn't the only one. Paul's not the only example. triumph through tribulation or hardship. You get a chance this week, read the story of Joseph in Genesis chapter 45 and chapter 50 through chapter 50. Joseph's brothers threw him in a pit. I'm sure when Joseph was left in that pit, he did not think anything good could come out of that. And yet if he had never been thrown in that pit, he would have never been sitting, able to sit on the throne and save his people. Okay. If you get the chance, read the story about John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress. We'll talk about that next week as well. 
See, God's the same today, yesterday, today, forever. And when we have situations and circumstances in our life that look like they're totally the opposite of what we would want or expect them to be, we have to understand and recognize that all things work together for the good. And that he will take whatever situation we're in and make it for the good as long as we are serving him and walking in his joy. So we'll pick up there next week. Talking about in Philippians chapter 1, 12 through 18, the joy of ministry in trials and tribulations and even with detractors. So we're going to stop there for a second. Do we have any prayer requests? Up oh, on the screen. All right. Dan Hartzell is asking for prayer for Brother Ron. He had surgery yesterday at Terry Medical Center. Dan Hartzell is Linda's aunt and Ron Hart or Ron. Uh, um, huh? Harner. I kept wanting to say Hartzell. Ron Harner um, is Linda's uncle. And so he's had medical problems and he's at Terry Hospital. Lori Fultz is asking for prayer for a co-worker, Celestia Shelley. She is a double lung transplant recipient in the Cleveland Clinic with pneumonia and on a ventilator. That's serious surgery. Margie Buckwalter is asking for prayer for Bob Wells, who's battling COVID. Also prayers for Anoli Wells, his father who had a post-operative stroke. So the needs are real, guys. And uh, you know, as bad as this COVID situation is, and it's bad, we still face the diseases that we face every day, cancer, heart attacks, stroke, accidents, all kinds of things. So, so the needs are real. We are going to uh, lift these needs up before the king. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we have together, the time to study your word. And Father, we are so thankful that your joy is our strength. We are so thankful that you have overcome this world once and for all. We are so thankful that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Father, what a blessing. What a way to live the joyful, spirit-filled life. We pray, Father, that you would help us to walk in your spirit, to sow in the spirit. Help us to be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Help us to understand that no matter what our situation, no matter what our circumstances, that your grace is sufficient and that all things work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Father, we thank you for those promises and pray that you would help us to be the men and women that you have called us to be. Help us to be full of your joy. Help us to recognize sin in our lives and to repent and to draw ever closer to you each and every day. We thank you for all that you've given us. Father, we come unto you on behalf of these prayer requests this morning. Those that are facing serious illness, those that, that may even be facing death itself. Father, we pray that you would be with them, that they would feel your peace and feel your presence, that their joy may be full in the face of their circumstances. Pray, Father, that you would not only bless them, but that you would bless their families, that you would strengthen all involved. And pray that everyone would see and recognize that you are in control and that you are on the throne. We pray, Father, for a spiritual renewal in our land and pray that you would be lifted up. We pray for our country. We pray for our president. We pray for the political situation as it is. We pray that your will would be done. And that your hand would be upon the United States of America. We pray that as we face a COVID pandemic, that you would protect all of us, that you would protect your people. And again, in every situation, in every circumstance, that you would be exalted and you would be lifted up. For you are worthy of all praise. We thank you for this opportunity today to serve. Pray that you would help us to keep our focus on you. Pray that our joy would be full and that you would be honored and glorified today. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. God bless you. God bless you. Have a great week. May the joy of the Lord be your strength. Lord willing, we will be here.